Vita, thank you for, for uh, giving us this, this interview and help us to reflect on the, the, the importance of pamphlet and student politics in, in, uh, in contemporary India. We would like to um, just have a student activist with you to reflect on your trajectory from uh, ISA student activist to uh, uh, to uh, a, a CPI uh, a CPI ML leader uh, and um, uh, also uh, the you are editing the CPI ML uh, liberation uh, uh, um, publication and also your involvement in in terms of, of feminism and gender gender rights. So for, first, I, I, uh, as we uh, are going to display uh, pamphlets in um, in the Habitat Center from 6th to 13th of uh, of November, uh, we found one that uh, you have uh, you have authored that um, I think is quite striking to to start this interview with. So I would just like to to read a bit from you sure. from what you wrote. Free thinking feminism which, since it does not define itself as Marxist, necessarily has no consistent agenda for social change, and thus in no position to change patriarchal structures. This leaves them in the position of defining sati, wid widow immolation, dory, or rape as evils in a basically good society, rather than the symptoms of an oppressive class-divided society. This deplorably inadequate position is paralleled by a Marxism which refuses to see the specificity and materiality of gender oppression and thus refuses the need for a feminist politics. ISA reiterates the need for Marxist feminism and a feminist Marxism as integral and synonymous parts of our ideology and struggle. So um, I, 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 we picked it, that quote uh, not only because it kind of brings together your your long-standing commitments uh, in, in 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 Indian politics, which is uh, of course the left in general and Marxism on the other side, feminism, but also because um, it it kind of uh, epitomized the kind of churning and and the debates that were happening at, right. at the time in in GNU campus. So first of all, from that quote, could you tell us a little bit how you arrived there, um, yeah. and then how how that ideological uh, understanding uh, was formed, and then inform your, your your later political career? Sure. Actually, I'm um, I was a, a little worried when you began reading out the quote because I had no idea what whether I would still feel. Uh, you know, still stand by the words which I wrote two decades ago. <laughs> okay, but I was quite reassured actually because uh, yeah, that's not bad. It's quite <laughs> close to what I would still say, although probably my articulation would have become a little bit more uh, cons you know so, so sophisticated now, or you know, I I would add a whole lot more now. But uh, I'll tell you how it was very interesting because in the nine early nineties. Uh, when we, I joined JNU, and that's when I really became active in student politics, uh, one of the things that pushed me into politics was the, um, you know, the, the very uh, scary prospect of the rise of the Hindu majoritarian right wing in India at that time, and uh, specifically in Bombay, where I had done my BA, as well as in JNU, uh, you know, in front of our eyes. And so their politics on gender was something which made me feel, oh, you know, we have to oppose this. And it can't be done just at the level of an individual, uh, you know, refusing to participate in it. Um, but you want to, you know, we, we, we felt you had to have a collective struggle. But what kind of collective struggle? So JNU at that time in the early 90s had a very, very um, interesting uh, spectrum of gender, gender, um, uh, you know, um, gender politics okay so of course um, you know you had and in that uh, I know that at that time the SFI which was the dominant kind of left organization there had a very sort of um, how do I put it it was quite a um, you know quite a, a conservative position on gender so they would never ever speak about they would never use the word feminist ever okay so it was 
absolutely taboo and in fact they would be quite um, you know judgmental about the uh, supposedly you know uh, supposed uh, you know lifestyles of uh, JNU uh, uh, ISA activists especially women and all of that okay so that was quite so that was one of the things which I know you know made uh, me feel much more at home in ISA because ISA used to be accused of being feminist and I felt like okay this is good you know because I would like to be with a left organization that is unashamedly feminist you know and ISA had a whole lot of women leaders at that time who were also kind of uh, fe- you know who were feminist and unashamedly so this did not mean that there were no debates in ISA they were um, you know so I remember that for instance with Tapas who was the general secretary then of ISA or with other uh, uh, activists of ISA, leaders of ISA at that time, including the JNUSU office bearers like Pranay or Chandrasekhar. Uh, I know that we had a whole lot of debates because uh, many things, uh, on many things, they did not really share the position which I was putting forward. And I had not come to Marxism, you know, first. I had come to feminist critiques of Marxism first and postmodernist critiques of Marxism. So that was my vantage point, and I had read no Marxism at all. Okay, on f- Feminism. So all that I knew about Marxism was from these critiques. So I think we both in those debates kind of learned from each other because they would encourage me to actually go and read Marx and read Engels and read Lenin and say, okay, then and then argue with those positions rather than arguing with positions that had been interpreted by their critics, right? And that was an interesting exercise for me because I discovered a whole lot of things there in Marx which were, you know, with a thrill of joy, like, oh my, I never, I never found this anywhere else, that kind of thing. So for me, those were uh, really wonderful moments because I had not found those in the criticisms. And on the other hand, the interpretations of Marxism that were very conservative or very vulgar Marxist and all of that, those were things which... Um, I could uh, actually correct in um, you know the articulation of my comrades in ISA. So that was a very exciting time. And the free thinking feminism we are talking about is actually a word which refers to the free thinkers who were a political organization. So it's not a general term used in general for feminism. But it's more about the free thinkers, which was an organization on the campus that had increasingly in the 90s become, a, you know, it used to be a kind of liberal group, but in the 90s it had become increasingly a pretty right wing group. So in fact, the free thinkers uh, collapsed when most of its um, members went over to the ABVP. And so the free thinkers were left with basically only a very few individual members then who, were, who, who then closed down the organization because they did not want to be part of. I'm um, so sorry, that was an interruption. Um, they managed to ring the bell, which doesn't have any... So, um, um, you know, so basically this was, uh, the free thinkers were a group that then that would try to talk about gender, but in a more of a, you know, in an in increasingly right wing framework, you know. So, uh, as I said, I mean, the, uh, at their best, they would be just talking about dowry or sati or whatever it is only as social evils, you know. So which was the more kind of, uh, which had no understanding of why does society have these evils in the first place? What place do these uh, do these practices function, you know, have in a society? So if you leave it only as evils, you're essentially going to a position that can become very orientalist, very racist, because then it looks at Indian society as being, you know, backward or whatever it is. It doesn't really look at what are the material underpinnings of this. And likewise, you know, there was a Marxism that would distance itself from any kind of insights on gender, sexuality, um, sexual orientation, uh, LGBT rights, all of that, because they would say, oh, that is NGO stuff, that's bourgeois stuff. So ISA was actually, um, I would say, you know, one of the groups that was articulating, you know, that was learning to articulate a left position at that time that was consistent with feminism and yet had a very, you know, had a Marxist uh, framework and Marxist analysis. Mm. And uh, so it was pretty exciting for us at that time. Yes, yes, and uh, as the, the question that immediately comes to mind is, um, a male com- coming from um, 
a militant uh, background till the 90s before turning to mass to, to, to electoral politics yeah. didn't necessarily have that time or that space to reflect on the intersectionality between uh, class and gender. To which extent do you think that campus, campus as space and people like you um, could bring could bring that um, that additional flesh yeah. to the ideological repertoire of organizations such as CPI? Um, you know, I think that both things. I think yes, uh, the campus spaces did contribute a lot, especially to the theoretical articulation and analysis. But in fact, the MLS history is very interesting, and it was uh, fascinating to me to uh, learn that, and uh, it in a way enriched my otherwise very mm -hmm. sort of you know, something that I, my feminism that came only from reading, uh, to actually look at the MLS history. And I was encouraged to do that, I remember, by Chandrasekhar, who uh, said that, you know, you should, uh, why don't you, uh, uh, you know, since you're committed, I remember that when he offered me a party membership the, for the first time in 96, just before he left for Sivan, uh, we had a long walk around the campus, and he said, you know, um, I want you to think, consider joining the CPIML. And he said, you know, you are passionately committed to, you know, women's rights, to feminism. Uh, don't you think that you might want to know more about what kind of struggles, you know, uh, so not just about what you can give the movement, but also about what the movement that women have, you know, the struggles that women have waged for so long, agricultural, laboring women, Dalit women, uh, what they can, you know, give you in terms of, you know, so, um, so he kind of very gently tried to tell me that, you know, don't go to this only through reading. Complement that reading with, you know, actually learning from what people uh, who are not very read, you know, they're, so they're not, you know, well read as such, but they have uh, arrived at insights to their struggle. So that movement, in fact, of the uh, uh, 80s especially of the CPI, that was a movement that had um, actually addressed the intersectionality of caste, class and gender in a big way and pretty organically, you know, not because they had a theoretical position that you should, but that they set out to organize the most oppressed in society. And the most oppressed class in society happened to be in Bihar agricultural laboring laborers. That was mostly Dalit and oppressed caste, other, you know, extremely backward caste people, and among them women. So, you know, so very gendered, you know, feudal practices that, you know, that were uh, humiliating to Dalit women and extremely backward caste women, as well as that were humiliating to Dalits in general, um, arrived as, you know, so on par with land and wages was dignity. So the question of dignity and the question of, um, you know, dignity of the oppressed castes and especially oppressed caste women uh, was right up there in the struggles, you know. So, um, in fact, even if you talk to women of that generation now who are quite elderly, I find it fascinating because they tell you about songs from that time and they tell you about uh, struggles from that time and they see that as a very empowering sort of uh, moment for them. Um, so in a way what we were doing you know, in JNU uh, to begin with was to actually give, give that a voice in a way, you know, give some of this uh, theoretical framework in which to analyze it because what was happening was that you know, while this was happening in, in, in fact, but if you read the pages of say liberation in, in 1996, you'd get a, you know, you'd get some, you'd get both, you'd get a debate in liberation also, because you had pieces by very good, very wonderful party leaders, but whose understanding on gender was very flat and very, you know, so they were just regurgitating, uh, you know, sort of positions on Marxist, uh, on gender, which were, you know, like British Communist Party type positions, which were very, very, uh, you know, wrong in a way, you know, so they were not even right from a Marxist point of view, in my opinion. So in my opinion, they were not just non-feminist positions, they were also non-Marxist positions, in my opinion. Whereas you had people in the pages of liberation, like Amrit Wilson, I remember this article by her in the 90s, mid-90s, arguing with those positions and saying, hello, you know, Marxism has to take into account social reproduction. So uh, the idea that uh, gender is all superstructure and the material structure is all class is not true. You know, it's not even true in a Marxist analysis. So all this, I think, was um, also very formative for us. It was not just that this was coming from campuses, 
but i do think that yes young the presence of young women in the party and in the student organization in in campuses made a difference both to you know contributed to the theoretical analysis as well as to the general culture in the party you know because then um you had uh, you know you uh, were not used to women from uh these backgrounds uh, holding themselves uh unselfconsciously as women you know so i'll just share one interesting thing with you that uh, in the i think it was in the late you know maybe 2007 or 8 i don't remember uh, quite late okay so in the noughties you know in the 2000s um there was a co- co- workshop we held on gender from the party side at bardhaman and we had a lot of party uh, members you know women party members there and there was the comrade dipankar was also there and a couple of all of us were there and i had presented a paper there and all of that so one young woman from a uh, women activist she's around my age i would say from um from the from bhojpur uh, in bihar she stood up to say to recall something and she said you know in 1996 i saw jnu women students at a rally which had happened in delhi so it was called the adhikar rally and the, we were activists at the rally you know helping the people would come from other states and all of that so it, it was an all india rally so she said i remember i saw them and i looked at them and i said i want to be like them and i asked her what she meant by that because generally uh, you know it would be the opposite right people would tell you that oh you know you should behave in certain ways so as not to shock women from rural areas and all of that but in fact it was the opposite so this woman said no i had always felt i'd always rebelled against being treated like a girl in my you know so i was a woman i felt uh, you know like a woman but i wanted i didn't want to be have forced to fit separate gendered norms so then she married uh, um, a she was not an activist to begin with but she was drawn to the party and then as a way of escape in a way from the usual trajectory for women she actually married a comrade and that in that choice to marry him was in fact for her uh, an empowering choice because she said everybody said why are you marrying a whole timer and why are you marrying someone who doesn't look young and handsome and earns a lot and she said no actually like what he does and i like what he thinks and so i'm marrying him so she married him and then in his family in a way she was encouraged to you know be do activism if she felt like it and she felt entirely at home doing that and then people would tell her oh you know would you wear a uh, shouldn't you wear a sari not salwar kameez shouldn't you wear sindoor when you go among women and she used to say no i don't think i need to do any of those things and then she saw us and she said you know i felt uh, the thing i liked about you people was that you didn't walk around as though you remembered you were women you walked around as people as human beings you didn't hold yourself as though somebody was continually watching you thinking she is a woman and she should behave in a particular way and i felt like that 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 we want that and i felt so vindicated in a way by what she said um so you know that gives you an idea in a way of the uh, the sheer physical presence of young women um you know who were from uh, these campuses um on the impact they had on the party <laughs> and, and you see in in what you are saying uh, about the three three things that are really fascinating three three blocks and if you could tell me a little bit how they implicate into each other I'd be really grateful like the, the first thing as you say is like the, the influence of 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 young women in campus um and the, the example you, you gave and the, the the second one is the, the imagination of smoldering fields of of bihar and the the condition of 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 women in rural areas in in in, in south bihar um and the, the the third one is the the kind of competition happening mm-hmm. in campus and and the way through, for instance the the parts we uh, uh, we have read with you um there's a there's a need to at uh, to, to 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 be distinguishable from both SFI and free thinkers so how is this competition also enabling the creation of I mean the rearticulation of these ideas that are informed both in the field and in campus through the rise of 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 uh, feminist uh, personalities in campus um yeah i'm not sure i can kind of draw all that together but i'll just say that uh, i don't think it was i don't think we felt it as a pressure to distinguish ourselves from groups or anything like that it was more that 
you know that was such a, a time when um, you know ISA provided a you know ISA was a space where women could um, explore a feminist articulation and explore you know what a Marxism that was compatible with feminism could look like um, in a freer way than you could in other left groups at that time. And also, uh, so it was not that ISA had a set position. That was what was so exciting because it's not that everybody thought one way in ISA, but that, that they were willing to let women lead on this, that they were willing to let feminist women lead on this. I remember another leaflet, which I might have around somewhere. I don't remember if this was it or another one was it. But there was a leaflet which had been signed by our then secretary of the organization. It was not signed by me. It was signed by Tapas Ranjan Saha, who was then the secretary of the organization. And I remember that it was articulating a position that he personally might not have held. He, did, he wasn't too comfortable with it because it said, you know, feminized Marxism. It said towards a feminized Marxism. That was a leaflet. And he wasn't comfortable with those phrases because he was very much a sort of very you know, traditional Marxist and he didn't think Marxism needed feminizing, you know. I'm not sure I would use those that phrase today either because I think Marxism itself is not what I thought it was in those days. But the point was that we wrote this in polemic in a way with whatever we were seeing around us. We, we were told those Marxist positions which were pretty un-Marxist and un-feminist in those days. And we insisted that it should come out as an ISA position and so it shouldn't just be signed by ISA women. It should be signed by who was the secretary. And if the secretary happens to be Tapas, then let it be signed as an ISA leaflet. So it's Tapas's leaflet. It's ISA's leaflet. And he agreed. And I remember that you know our national leadership and all had asked him that, oh, did you write this leaflet? <laughs> because this isn't quite the position we have. <laughs> what is all this feminized Marxism? And he said, well, you know, these are ISA activists and they've written a leaflet. And this has to come out as an ISA leaflet by whoever is the ISA office by us. So it's signed by them and it's also signed by me because we, this is an ISA position. It's not a personal position of anybody. So that space I can't imagine other left groups having had at that time. No way. You know. So in a way that was a space where all these, even the Bihar um, struggles influence the issues of caste and all of that could kind of you know begin to come in in a way um, you know because we were able to play around with it, able to try and understand what was happening in our own ways. Yeah. And uh, what, is, what is striking in what you're saying is um, the importance that pamphlet occupies in, in both asserting one's position in the field um, and also bringing together the organization, yeah. um, the different voices and the kind of debates that, yeah. that, that happen within. Could you reflect a little bit on the importance of, of, of pamphlets? pamphlets yeah. Um, you know, I think that for me, in fact, I feel that, you know, you asked me about my role as in liberation and all of that. And if you had asked, if anybody had asked me in 1993 when I was a student in the MA and I just joined, whether, you know, some years from then I would be editing a Marxist magazine, I would have thought they were crazy, okay, because I didn't, I wouldn't have felt confident thinking of myself as an editor of anything and certainly not of a polemical magazine and all of that and uh, you know, nothing like that. But I think the process of writing leaflets and even I remember, the, I, I still remember the first leaflet that I ever wrote when I was in ISA. That was in 94 when there was a ABVP, um, you know, contesting an election in a very uh, sort of very um, communally polarized, you know, they were trying to they were trying to communally polarize the campus at that time. And uh, so it was a very nasty kind of election. There was a public meeting in the Ganga mess where they, they had, you know, there was a... Um, just, tell, just tell him not to <laughs> talk. No, no, it distur distracts me also, yeah. So and one year of, the, yeah. Uh, sorry. So I think the, you know, so the... Um, so there was this... Uh, uh, student activist, of, student of the leader of the Vidyarthi Parishad of the um, what's it called? The Shiv Sena. So it was a Shiv Sena student wing, 
and there a man on the campus had held a public meeting in which he had said some perfectly awful things about women about how women like us would be in jail in a hindu nation right once we achieve the hindu nation place for women like you will be in jail and all of that okay so um i remember that we were so agitated by that that we became active in the isa 1994 campaign although that was an election in which we had been asked to contest from isa refused to contest uh, as councillor candidates because of which isa ended up having an all male councillor panel in sl so we campaigned for that panel like crazy mm. and in every classroom people would be asking us why hasn't isa fielded any women because you have so many campaigners there's the, the four or five women <laughs> campaigners and no candidates and these men who were contesting would glare at us they would really give us the dirts because they said we didn't want to be contesting we wanted you people to be contesting and then you all said no <laughs> and now because of that we are stuck with this so that was an experience and i remember that at that time then i began and that, that after that meeting that right wing meeting we wrote our first leaflet you know and my experience of writing the leaflets itself was very formative because for me that was the first instance that you write not because you write for self expression but you write because um you have to you know there has to be a leaflet that evening on this issue that is being debated or um you know to intervene in a particular like if it's for, for international women's day or whatever you you write it to so you're writing on a deadline and so you're writing in the middle of writing other like academic work and you so i would and you had to write by hand in those days of course you didn't couldn't type you didn't, nobody had computers uh, personal computers so i would be writing in um, you know i would be writing in um, cafes you know in the campus and canteens on the campus um and all of that and uh, learning then to write in write legibly so that someone else can type it i had very bad handwriting and so i had to learn to write in a way that someone else could be able to read it and all and that was a certain kind of discipline that then you know made me realize that okay when i was asked to do liberation work i realized oh i can do this actually because i have now actually learned to write um you know on a deadline and learned to write with economy of words so you have to write you know to a schedule and you have to write knowing that it has to fit these many words and all of that so um yeah that was an amazing experience and i think that you know the leaflets arguing with each other on the campus that was much more a thing i'm not sure you know now with facebook and social media being so much more of a thing where you can read stuff online rather than read them you know read them on your phone rather than picking up a physical leaflet on the campus in those days there was no space like that right so you know picking up that leaflet you know for us it was a routine you enter the mess and you see oh what are the leaflets there so who's got out what leaflet and you're reading those and you're figuring out you know what the arguments are you're arguing about it at the dinner table and all of that you know that was a big part of jnu politics a very very important part of it yeah uh, and would you say that uh, that the pamphleteer style um that was there in the pamphlets has now moved on 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 social media when I mean, you are extremely vocal on, on on social media to which extent your experience as a pamphleteer is now encapsulated in your in in, in your way you call for actions and you denounce things on on twitter for instance yeah i know that for instance um yeah as i said i mean one thing is of course the economy of words and all of that which helps then on social media as well right because you learn to say something you know within a set number of words so if you have to say something in a tweet it has to be just that long and not long and you're able to do that better because you have the training but also i think that you know what uh, we brought to it um i know that i know many students of that time who used to collect isa leaflets okay so they would keep isa leaflets because uh, they felt that those were particularly well you know and they were not necessarily political activists who were archiving it for political purposes they kept the leaflets because they thought um that those leaflets were extremely good so there were leaflets in hindi which pranay had written uh you know which i remember you know thinking they were uh, you know they were wonderful leaflets you know because in a sense they brought together literature they brought together politics 
and they uh, you know so pranay's speeches were a total you know uh, work of you know i know jnu teachers would come and listen to pranay pranay was the first jnu as president from isa teachers would come and listen to his speeches because they would say oh uh, and i remember hearing a teacher tell another teacher uh, is he better than 90% of the teachers of jnu or just better than 100% of the teachers <laughs> in jnu because he's so good you know and the, so the sheer depth of um, you know um, intellectual rigor that was being brought to the leaflet uh, that was something i think which uh, was very very you know it was an isa trademark at the time so i remember there were leaflets that were written by pranay leaflets written by somebody called uh, dipankar at that time he was a he later left isa but and he's now a very good economist and um, dipankar basu uh, i he wrote some absolutely wonderful leaflets and i remember that he and i would uh disagree with each other would feel irritated because he said i can ri- i can't write on demand like that i can write only when you know i feel the need to write something and i would say yeah but i feel the need to write something when it is needed you know so i i also don't write on demand i write when the situation demands it and the situation demands it i feel like i have to write it now and i still operate like that you know so i still feel like uh sometimes when there's something i'm i know angry about and feeling like intervening in i feel like i cannot rest until i have actually gotten it out there either in the form of an article somewhere which i can now send on to to some portal or some paper or in the form of you know some article for liberation or whatever it is so that was the thing even then you know um so we brought i think we were uh, you know we brought our intellectual you know our classroom experience our intellectual reading experience our library reading and our activism and our and the experience of you know arguing in person with people to that right so i remember that one leaflet which people really appreciated was a leaflet that was not signed by isa it was not an isa leaflet it was signed by where we i but i drafted it and then it was signed by various students that was when adwani was invited on the campus by the uh, administration in 90 it was the first vajpayee administration this was sometime in 98 after 98 and vajpayee had been call, uh, adwani had been called on the campus to uh, of all things not to no you know he, he wasn't called as a in a public meeting by the abvp which would have been fine he had been called uh, on behalf of the spanish center to release some book in spanish okay on something else so that was an academic space and he was invited you know to uh, you know the academic space was being used to legitimize a far right uh, political leader and ideologue and so we said no this shouldn't happen so we campaigned against it and then there was this whole thing about freedom of speech and expression and there was a lot of confusion on the campus so we i drafted that leaflet and i asked several other people who are not isa people you know would you like to sign it and they signed it and we got it out as a leaflet by students who said uh, who articulated this you know properly saying that look this is not if you were to come on an abvp platform that's fine you know come it's a niche, it's a place where we are allowed to ask questions and you face the questions and you come uh, if you were to come if you were to organize a bjp meeting on the campus no problem but you are coming to release a book on, from the spanish center why you don't know spanish you're not an academic you have nothing to do with academics why would you be invited to the to deliver a talk at the spanish center to which then there can be no question answer right it's a book release function you know it's not going to he's not going to be allowed to you know take questions or anything so that made a lot of sense to a whole lot of people and i remember that uh, my friend rochelle at that time rochelle pinto uh she came up and she she told me this is very well written she asked me suspiciously who's drafted this it's very well written so i told her yeah that's me <laughs> so she said it was brilliantly done actually it was very 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 well done and uh, the reason why i could do that was because you know i was also thinking i was not thinking just as an activist i was thinking as a political being who was both an academic and intellectual as well as an activist you know and i was thinking about how to safeguard academic spaces not just about how to you know find some pretext to oppose adwani uh, what is fascinating is when we see this mechanic of pamphlet writing is also how that mechanic also translates into a physical object that connects with people 
but it's not only something you put online but it's something that enables you to go and talk to people yes so to which extent you see pamphlets as a tool of political socialization yeah uh, so i think it's very important and i still think of it as a pretty um, you know you, it's a tool which i still feel that um, you know politics like ours cannot do without uh, you know it needs it i'll tell you why for instance right now um, you would think that in the digital age and all of that you know what is the point of uh, leaflets and all of that right like and i know that in jnu you know there are people who say okay people are reading leaflets less they'll read it on your phone and uh, all of that and that's a good thing in a way because i say if the jnu administration now is preventing public meetings from being held then great i mean at least you know there's a space there's a social media space where those discussions can take place and all of that uh, so that's fine um, um uh, just a second yeah yeah so um i just wanted to, uh, yeah so basically i think uh, but the point is that you know uh media spaces are generally you know so big media is not going is against you so you are up against it and it's much more propagandist than it was in the 90s right now big media you know i wish in fact i wish i hanker for the time when there was only doordarshan okay which was at least you know it was a state sponsored thing but it wasn't hate mongering and it was you know everyone knew that this is a government channel okay there was no illusions about it now you have uh, 24/7 channels that are spreading islamophobic and uh, anti dissent hate speech continuously as news as independent news and you know it's it's a scary mm. prospect so how do you counter it and i keep thinking that there is no a replacement at the end of the day because social media reach in india is also pretty limited right so i feel like there's no um replacement at the end of the day for actually going to people with a physical piece of writing and then talking to them about that uh, of course in india literacy being low uh, there is going to be a limitation even to that mm. but still you generally find you know i've found that when you go with a leaflet even to a village then uh, there'll be some school kid school girl who'll say i can read that and so she'll read it out and then there'll be a talk around it there'll be a discussion around it and that's amazing you know uh, really irreplaceable i think yeah. that's the more like the online part can be an addendum or can be a, an additional part to the yes yes of course i mean i'm, I'm all for using online uh, means as well especially video and audio and all of that because those are things that you do not require literacy in the first place so that's good but i also think that these are you know these are you know leaflets are things that allow you uh, you know uh, they f- it they make you you know you have to articulate things in a simple way which is communicable or oh, that's another thing which i find um, you know i find my leafleting days in jnu really help with which is that um, you know i think of myself as being someone who even when i speak on the street i don't dumb down what i say on the street you know so what i say on the street and what i say in a seminar in london is not very different it's more or less the same thing i don't dumb down at all you know um and i'm not using very different language and yet what i say on the street connects with people uh as much as what i would say in a seminar connects with people so i think about you know why i'm able to do that and i think that the you know the training in writing leaflets is a big uh, part of that because i would feel the need to okay how does one say this so that it communicates so that someone who reads it is going to actually get it so you know cutting through the jargon and cutting through heavy vocabulary and finding examples that make sense and all of that was something you know so i think it's pretty regular kind of stuff that you know marxists have always done actually you know most of lenin's writing is pamphlets you know leaflets <laughs> and the great fun to read now because they you know they are not solemn pieces they are polemical pieces in marx lenin I mean, they are all writing polemical arguments with their contemporaries you know they are there these are fun stuff to read if you understand the arguments going on you know <laughs> yeah uh, the, you emphasize on the, the, this idea of learning how to write pamphlets and you know campuses in terms of uh, the space to learn politics are extremely rich in transforming individuals 
do make them fit for further commitment in, in, in civil society and for, for some, some people like you, you yeah. full-time politics. To, to which extent do you think that the, the, the campus has transformed or has enabled you to, to, to do what you're doing today? In a very big way, actually, because I think for me the main transformation was, uh, you know, my change from a very, very, very private person to a very public person. And it was a painful change for me because I was, uh, you know, I have always been a very introverted, very, very private person. And um, therefore, I did not want to be someone who was out there, who was uh, continuously on call publicly at all, you know. And uh, I did not uh, enjoy public dispute, public debate. I didn't enjoy it. I would have much, I imagined myself to be someone who would be a very private person, you know, teaching somewhere or writing, you know, something somewhere, writing, you know, academic books or something, but in private. I never thought of myself as someone who was a public figure. So th what pushed me to do that was the sense of urgency seeing, as I said, I mean the rise of far-right politics. I have the far-right to thank for making me an activist because I was like, you know, you can't have this happening and do nothing. Something has to be done, you know. And something has to be done meant I couldn't just sit there and watch others do it and say, okay, I'll vote for you and that's it. I felt like, oh, you know, because I had friends in ISA who were activists and who were struggling to uh, juggle their academic life with their political life, and I could see how difficult they were, how thin they were stretching themselves. And I would see people like Titi or Tapas and Chubra doing this, and I would think, I'd feel guilty. I'd feel like, okay, I can't, you know, not do my bit. So then I have to do my bit. And, um, so sense of responsibility and all would push me into that. And then they said contest elections and I felt like digging a hole and hiding under it, okay? Because I was not someone who felt I could ever contest an election, speak out there and be, you know, face criticism like that. Because being a public figure means that you are continuously exposed to a very public criticism. And it was painful and I couldn't bear the thought of it. I literally physically wanted to run away. But then, uh, you know, I remember that it, again, it was Tandu who convinced me, he's, you know, that had to be done and you know you are the best person to do it and therefore you know it would not be fair for others to have to feel someone else when you are actually the obviously you know the person whom we need it's not because you are great so for me coming to politics was pretty different from you know I see some people in, pol in student politics who are more like individuals who would like a political career and then I'm not saying it in a negative way I'm just saying it in a descriptive way that they are looking for a political career and looking for the right platform so in student politics it will be one platform and then when they leave the campus they look for another platform and all of that and it's all about okay my politics is something I'm carrying with me and I can carry it with me to whichever party I go to for me it wasn't like that at all it was like politics was something which was a responsibility um, and I didn't want to be the person in the limelight at all. I didn't want to be the person contesting and winning elections at all. Uh, I was willing to do the work. But putting myself out there was because I felt it was needed. And that, you know, I remember after I won elections, uh, Chandu came up to me the day we won elections and I was exhausted and, you know, that entire process of campaigning had been painful for me. And at the end of it, he came, we had won the election and I thought, okay, now finally I can rest, right? And he came up to me, called me out of Ganga Hostel and said, come with me now because both of us have won the election. Only he and I had won on the central panel. And we have to go to all the camp, all the hostels now. I said, again? No. <laughs> and he said, yes, we have to go and say thank you and meet people and figure out, you know, what, what they'd like us to do and all of that. And I felt so angry with him at that time, you know, I felt furious with him because I was like, no. And then I remember his face fell because I said, no. And then I kind of made myself go on, on several occasions with him. And I realized that, um, you know, he was such a public person. He was out there all the time on call for the smallest thing, you know. And I realized that he was on call even for someone like me. You know, when I was doing my MPhil as a JNUSU office bearer and I was in tears one day because I felt I'm not able to, you know, 
do my work and I'm in a you know in a state of panic about my work I remember that he took me to his room made sure I had nice things to eat because I had mouth sores and he made sure that my food was cooked and then he said okay tell me what he had no idea about my political my my academic work right so he said okay tell me what is it you need what is the problem so I told him what my area was which was to do with Hindi um, you know the history of Hindi as a subject that is taught in schools and all and he said okay i can't help but i think maybe krishna kumar could and krishna kumar is an academic and why don't i put you in touch with him and krishna you should go and meet him and he might help so let me do that for you and you know it felt so much better to have someone to talk to and i realized this man does this with everybody he is doing this with everybody and i realize now that i do that quite a bit all the time you know i'm always on call and it was certainly jnu that made me ready for that i wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise i know i've kind of rambled on but i guess you can no, edit it you. yeah you can edit that <laughs> but essentially yeah i mean the story was that jnu made me ready to be- become a public person mm. and to overcome my sense of uh, no i don't want to talk to more than four people at a time and i'm very happy with three and a half friends thank you okay. you know that was what i was Do you now enjoy being a public person? I still struggle with it. Uh, I, I I think that is the the most the, you know the biggest thing that I still struggle with, because uh, essentially inside somewhere there is a very private person here who doesn't enjoy the social media noise, doesn't enjoy the uh, publicity, doesn't enjoy being the face that is shown on Republic TV all the time. Although I never go there, and having random people on the street recognize me and say, "Oh, I saw your face on Republic TV," and I'm like, "Where can I hide?" You know. So I don't. I don't particularly. But I, I, st- you know, I still find that you know I can live with it now, <laughs> and I spend a lot of my time in public spaces like p- party offices. a lot of my time i spend very little time at home so most of my time is spent in public spaces around people and all of that and i find that yeah i can do it <laughs> i need to hide sometimes <laughs> the there, there, there are two things that are really striking <laughs> in what you in what you say first it appears to to me that the campus is also a space where you meet role models that inform that inform your you you Your, your politics and 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 Chandu is a could yeah. be a great example of it. Yeah. And then the second thing is the how ideological politics is tightly uh, articulated with um, some kind of service-based politics, where you have to help others, where you have to assist students, where you have to to to, <coughs> to solve crises that have nothing to do with politics, but brings people into a, a, a political community. that they force and able to have a base for for further for for further action mm-hmm. all these two things uh, role models you know, and um so yeah but you know i thought about that and i think uh, that from a feminist point of view i would disagree that those uh, social things that political activists do are nothing to do with politics because frankly i think that those are in fact social reproductive labor emotional labor is a big part of politics because your in- politics is all about people and wherever you work it's not just campuses anywhere that you work among people uh, people are individuals at the end of the day so politics is not just the collective groups of people that are shouting a slogan or you know demand making a demand or you know being jailed or facing the police <coughs> politics is also about the individual household that is uh, where somebody has lost a job and is struggling to survive and is wondering politics is also about a household in which both the parents are working and maybe there's a teenage child who is in trouble of some kind because you know there's very little uh, interaction that uh, the child is able to have with their parents how do you help there it's all kinds of things you know and especially with you know women you know so the, uh, uh, domestic violence or sexual violence inside the household and all are things that you need a lot of emotional labor you need to bring a whole lot of emotional labor to that even running an organization you know i keep saying this that um in my experience of politics um i think about uh, to me the most key figures have not been those who have mainly played the role of uh, just giving speeches or something okay or contesting elections sometimes they've been the same person 
but in fact the most key person in any political organization i have worked in have been the people doing this social reproductive labor of nurturing cadres nurturing individual activists figuring out what's happening in their lives in their minds being around to hear their you know even their broken heart or you know their 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 uh, <coughs> they're being torn about something in their personal life or whatever it is you know their their dilemmas about their career or anything um and that social reproductive labor has been so i find that the most remarkable men i've known in politics um that was right there being one of them is actually someone who's done that kind of social reproductive labor on a big scale and those were the people i admired the most i still admire the most you know the people i see as really role model chandu was one of them absolutely um you know so this kind of giving of uh, uh oneself is something you know mm. i've seen it in some others who are not political i know i had an aunt like this who used to be on call like this all the time as a social person she was not a social activist and she was not a political activist at all but she was and i remember that as growing up as a child you know i used to look at her i was a private person my mother was a private person and i used to look at her and wonder how does she do this you know she has to be crazy how does she do this and then i realized that well in political organizations it's such an important part of that and i think it's key to politics uh, is this part involves a form of selflessness if to devotion to people even to the point of giving yeah. giving so much for the, the in a way i guess but you know in the case of somebody like chandu and all i used to be very wary about you know after he was killed it was so easy to use the words <coughs> sacrifice and all of that and i kept thinking well chandu loved doing this he would have hated having a 9 to 5 job and you know doing something somewhere so he it, i don't know about sacrifice and selflessness to some extent yes because yes it is a uh, you know it's not something easy that you do but also i think you know i think i think sometimes about, about that che guevara quote that people say about you know politics being he wrote this in a letter to someone about it's being the capacity to love and uh, you know i i've come to realize that that's not just some empty romantic statement you know, because love is not just you know some kind of romantic love love is actually you know the ability so when charu majumdar or someone talks about loving the people it's not really it's, it's a pretty real thing you know this is something people are doing full time you know they're doing it in terms of a genuine concern and caring for people uh they don't do it because they think they are sacrificing something you know they do it because they genuinely feel a connection with people uh, the people i know best I, i i'm not sure i can say this in all truth about myself as i said i do struggle with this but the people i've seen who do this best are pretty amazing that way because they really they really are that person you know they're not just playing that role you know they're really spending much of their time in a very deep connection with people is this the difference somehow between a form of leftist political commitment and form of religious religious practice in particular hindu religious practice that on one hand the kind of efforts and sacrifice in religious practice is for yourself or self salvation and that in political movements such as ml and others of the left movement you there's a form of dedication that brings to yourself but also enables collective empowerment in a way i don't know see i can't speak for religious uh, practice at, at its best because i don't know that i've never been a part of that and i don't share that I can't say, you know, I can I can imagine that there are uh, for instance I've been struck by uh, the strong culture in Punjab for instance of a lot of uh, voluntary activism. So you'll find, you know, absolute ordinary citizens organizing water in the summer, you know, giving out water in the summer to people uh, helping to reconstruct somebody's house that has fallen down and all of that and I feel that part of it has come from the culture of Sikh, uh, you know, the Sikh you know the culture of the sikh uh, faith as well as the sikh as well as the deras in punjab which are you know sort of um, separate from the sikh faith but they also so there is a culture of volunteerism there which is also partly spiritual partly faith based right so i don't think that this is just a you know only a political thing i just say that you know um, the thing is that 
the difference i think is that uh in a faith based thing or a charity based thing there can be the tendency to sort of feel that you are giving something to people uh you know so there's a condescension there can be a condescension involved there can be there isn't always but there can be so i remember this eunice de souza poem you know she was my teacher in my be in bombay and she has this poem very sarcastic poem about the catholics uh, charity at christmas you know so they what they're saying you know about stand in line and don't take it twice and you know don't spend it on drink and you know so it's very you know very sort of so i'm just saying in political activism i think it's different because people i know who have done this work genuinely feel they are learning from people so they are not feeling that they are uh, doing anyone a favor you know so people i know who have uh, lived with who have been shaped by this experience of uh, living with uh, living living with people especially in ml you know so i know you know a comrade of mine who in his student days you know he began working in pantnagar in uttarakhand he started living oh, you know with working class families as part of those families and how and he talks about how those families you know treat him as their own make sure he had food to eat and make sure you know he was a smoker so they would make sure that you know he had cigarettes and mm-hmm. stuff like that which and he was he had absolutely no money and all of that and had a kind of connect and what he learned from those families you know about um, and he tells me you know about how he learned from those families about selflessness you know in a huge way for because he told me recently about one comrade who passed away you know i don't know whether you used this or not but i'm just speaking about it he told me about you know one comrade who he recently passed away so he told me that you know uh, i remember something about that man uh, that once you know this this activist friend of mine needed a bus fare to go and attend a meeting somewhere so he needed the fare from the village to the town where the meeting was being held and he had zero money so he told this comrade whose house he was staying in ki i need the money so he said but i don't have the money and then he said well then you know, better find the money somewhere because he, it's a small amount right 5 rupees or something you find it so that guy went around after some time and said okay i have this money uh, so you can have it so after he had taken the money uh, that comrade said well no i better go and find some more right now so he said no what for what exactly so then he said oh actually you know my daughter is terribly ill she has high fever and uh, i've been asked to get this medicine and i i need to buy it and this comrade was like why didn't you tell me you know you can't do that you can't not buy medicine for your daughter come right now and we get medicine for your daughter first and then we figure out figure this out he said i hadn't realized you know he hadn't realized that the daughter was ill because he'd been out all day and he hadn't realized the daughter so he remember he remembers feeling this total sense of you know shock that this man actually thinks that um you know caring for this comrade and his need to you know run this party because attending this meeting is for our party so the feeling that our party's needs are you know our organization's needs are you know on par with that of one's family <laughs> that is something pretty um, you know scary in a way but uh, yeah i mean it's a, it, so one is learning also from uh, and one is not and one wants decisions to be taken you don't feel that because you are the whole time are in this place you should be the one taking the decisions you are encouraged to think that the decisions have to be you have to put yourself behind back and make sure that you are in fact creating an enabling or atmosphere where people are able to actually take decisions for themselves and you know feel empowered that way so you are not doing someone a favor i don't know if that's a useful but this was something that was dinned into me even in my student activist days dinned into me but you can't feel superior you can't feel that you are going to take some if you're going to a slum as a student activist you can't go there as a you know little tourist or you can't go there thinking you are doing them a favor and you're going there to learn that's your school you know <laughs> you are actually going there to learn this was something that was absolutely that you know that in the ml is like very very clear and very big part of it this is really fascinating because you know like ml has built his is is based its political base from linking question of landlessness with question of of dalit empowerment in, in in bihar and that requires people from outside to don't feel superior 
know, to access the condition and the livelihood of the people who, who you, who you want to represent. Is this process of unlearning or humility or declassing very important and central in, in ML politics and in your personal trajectory? Extremely so. I mean, I think that's pretty central to the ML trajectory. And it's not so much, you know, that's what I felt, that it's not so much declassing in an artificial way. So you are not asked to, you know, it's not like a personal um, lifestyle thing. So it's not like, you know, um, somebody who is working in urban India and uh, in urban India and teaching somewhere or is working somewhere has to live like a you know slum dweller. Not like that. It's more about if you're working, if you are a grassroots activist of the ML and you're working among them, whatever your work requires, you must do. And so if your work requires that you're organizing on the ground then, you know, you live among them and you organize among them. That's pretty straightforward and simple. Because, uh, and you're encouraged to be dependent upon them. You're encouraged not to be dependent for your basic needs also um, on anything from outside. So ML has very little in the way of stipends and all of that. We give stipends only to very, very few activists. We can't afford to very much. So, you know, so stipends and things are kept for like emergency needs, you know, somebody's medical needs suddenly and all of that. The more, uh, you know, so day to day dependence of activists is on the people among whom they live. So that's, you know, um, that is a very formative, very important thing. Um, I do think it's important. Mm -hmm. how, 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 do you, how do you understand it on an everyday basis in terms of your daily life? Yeah. Uh, just remind me what you had asked earlier, just because I mean I understand what. Just, just this remember. question of of, of uh, mm -hmm. unlearning and declassing. Ah yes, 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 uh, declassing. Um, okay. So I think you know, in terms of uh, the biggest thing, I think is in terms of uh, being actually uh, willing to realize that uh, you are accountable to people. So feeling accountable, feeling answerable. Uh, that is it in a big way. So it isn't just some, you know, lifestyle that you live and all of that. Uh, it's also about, you know, uh, the fact that those people have a right to demand accountability from you um, as an activist, as a leader and all of that. And so they, um, and they feel that sense of, so all the entitlement is on the side of the people there, okay. So I find this very interesting in the sense, I'll give you two instances. One, it, one is of course of comrades who told me that they came from, you know, when they first became old timers in the 1980s or the late 70s and all of that. And so they were from, you know, uh, households which were not very, uh, which were pretty comfortably off. So they were not, so when they first began working in these uh, Dalit uh, agricultural laboring households, everything, even like something like diet was a challenge because they were not used to eating something like pork or beef or, um, or, or uh, you know, uh, what is in field mice and all of that, right? That was not something they were used to in their diet. And so learning to be respectful to that food and saying that I will eat this even though, you know, I initially would find it, you know, repugnant or strange and not be used to it. But, you know, you, you eat it. Um, and you actually learn to, you know, develop a taste for it, in fact, because you feel, yes, this is something that these people are eating and relishing. And if I'm living among them, I can't treat their food with disrespect. They are feeding me out of, you know, what they have, that kind of thing. The other thing about the entitlement bit was that um, I remember that quite uh, some time back, I you know, there was a, uh, I was at the ARA office of our party, which you have seen now. Uh, at that office, you know, there were some you know women sitting outside and all that, which there often are. You know, they come there and you know, so there'll be women selling pork and women you know doing things, and they are with the party, so they've come there and they say. So there was one elderly lady, and Santosh Seher, who is one of our activists, who is also a cultural uh, activist as well as a writer and also one of our central committee members. He went up to her and asked her, you know, uh, Chachi. Um, so how are things, you know, how are things not in your life, how, what do you think, how do you think the party is doing, where you live, where you come from. So she gave it thought and, you know, gave a little critical analysis of what she thought was going well and what she thought was, you know, bad, okay, not bad, but yeah, could be better kind of thing. 
so she, he said so what do you think you know needs to be done to make it better and all of that so she said look and she talked about the secretary and you know basically the whole time activists in her area and she said uh, yeah so uh, they're doing okay work now and we are keeping a good eye on them and if they don't do good work we are going to take them to task yeah so don't worry yeah i have it in hand so in a way you know what santosh says and i later discussed was that she sounded almost like an employer talking about her employees so it was not like a so she was not the leader she was not a political leader herself she was an elderly woman and she was but she felt an immense sense of entitlement over you know all the activists there she didn't feel she was you know she didn't feel they were her leaders or whatever she felt like okay you're doing a job on our behalf you better do it right and you know i have an eye on you and yeah that kind of thing so that that sense of entitlement i find uh, you know pretty remarkable actually and that is really what uh, i think is the real sort of school and university for ml activists <laughs> yeah <laughs> because you, you can't escape that that is ruthless okay you can't hide behind anything there nothing is hidden you know so this publicness you you can't you cannot this is not something that you can wear as a costume and do because you are do you know you are literally under the scrutiny of people uh who know everything there is to know about you and your you know how you are doing your politics and they're very kind to you they're very you know i've had um a student activist from jnu a woman activist who was a smoker so people were like oh my god we are going to rural sivan and how is she going to you know oh people will be shocked if she smokes and stuff but she's a strange you know she's a she's a, a she needs to smoke she spent her time in rural sivan and came back and the women were so loving to her i can't tell you because they were so appreciative of the work that she was helping or the kind of the kind of work she was doing there that they would make sure she was supplied with bds and cigarettes and everything and they also smoked bds so they didn't think it at all ms and so you know your expectations of people about what this experience is going to be like is actually very different from what it really is and as long as you have the so my you know advice to anybody who's doing this kind of activism you know starting to is to say that you know don't think that you have to be a particular way even if you're living in a flat you know uh, and uh, going to work in a slum in bangalore you don't have to feel that you embarrassed about it that is who you are you don't have to pretend to be something else but when you are working there then you should you know subject yourself to uh, you know whatever it is that they need you to do and you should feel accountable to them that's it you know and they will accept you if you're a woman who is dressing in a particular way who is unmarried who is not wearing you know uh, behaving in a particular tradition they'll get used to it in no time okay they may question it, you about it for a bit okay and saying but if you're married i get asked this all the time if you're married how come you don't have sindoor how come you don't have bangles how come you don't have kids all of this okay so it doesn't go on for very long it goes on for a bit and then people get used to it and they stop asking you about that and they start seeing you for who you are which is an activist who's doing a certain kind of work there is is there a point of of tension between a certain form of activism who who wants to be uh close to the people and therefore for certain background and certain profile it means living behind certain things and a little bit of declassing and a certain form of aspiration on, on the ground of people to aspire up, dream of dream big uh, going to be a famous politician or businessman or so is there is there a conflict between those trajectory of of downward mobility and those aspiration of upward mobility on the ground people say no 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 we should aspire to drive in a suv and to have fancy clothes and is there is this something you feel uh, on the it's ground not just on it, I, i yes there is a tension there you put a, a finger on it but it isn't just about upward mobility and downward you know so i won't put it that way i think that tension is there uh, in politics at all levels okay so i think one of the things about uh, it, that we contend with is that you're living in a society where politics is defined as individual achievement okay so individual as an individual career 
So and I think that with social media and all of that, this has become even more of a thing where you're able to project yourself as an individual all the time. And I know that for me, for instance, this degree of public recognition came when I was in my 40s and I had a very solid ML schooling behind me. So I was able to kind of cope with it, you know, with media recognition and social media recognition and all of that. I was able to cope with it and, you know, keep a non-swollen head about it. In a, you know, I found it much easier to do this, okay? So my comrades around me would feel quite entitled to make sure that I... I didn't start, I, I didn't forget who I was, okay? So they would tell me that, oh, these people, are, for instance, there was an India Today story that described me as the mass mobilizer in the 2012 movement. And our party secretary at that time in Delhi, he looked at me and said, you, you are the mass mobilizer. <laughs> the party, you know, and I knew that within the, all, the ma you know, all the mobilization is done by an entire collective of activists, you know, of whom I am a very small part, okay? So I, you know, so this thing about being the person who's recognized, you know, as the face, whereas there are so many others, and I keep trying to encourage media people and all to go talk to others who are doing fantastic work, why don't you talk to them? And they don't, you know, they're happy with having found one face to fit into their panels and all of that. So this is the thing. The thing is that with younger people, I feel, and people right now, it's harder because you are, you know, your idea about politics is that, okay, uh, it is a platform where you can win elections and be recognized as an individual and all of that. So to make that compatible with, uh, you know, looking at achievement a little differently, looking at achievement as a collective achievement rather than an individual achievement, not looking, at, you know, so that's a tension at all levels. So you find that tension in rural India as well, very much. Uh, you find that tension in, you know, in campuses as well and with campus-based activists as well. So, um, so I think the, you know, the real, uh, you know, for us, but in the ML and all of that, it's, we, you know, it's, it's, it's welcomed and encouraged if someone has an ambition uh, to be an activist in the sense of, in every sense of the word. So that's fine. Uh, because as I said, I mean, you're wanting to contest elections and win them and all of that is also something that is, uh, you know, that's a commitment on your part. But it shouldn't be about the SUV and the, that stuff. Mm -hmm. That is the thing. That's the key thing. So I think some of our best MLAs, for instance, some of our best, you know, MLAs have been people who have, you know, been those public figures, public enjoying public recognition and respect, while not, you know, while actually being that public person, you know, available to all. So, for instance, just to give you a more recent example, I mean, you know, not the Ram Naresh Rams and the, you know, the legendary figures, but a more sort of, you know, more, you know, someone closer to me in background is somebody called Vinod, Vinod Singh from Jharkhand, okay, he was the MLA, he's no longer an MLA. Uh, so, his father was Mahendra Singh, who was an MLA also, and Mahendra Singh was also, a, you know, pretty much amazingly unique personality. Uh, but, and Mahendra Singh was, was one of those who, in fact, on campus who came and in JNU, when we were in a very weak situation in JNU, he had come and he had said something which made a big difference to the way we we worked at that time. He had said, look, uh, how do you expect people to be attracted to your politics if you're not doing, you have to be there for them, you have to serve, you know, you, students have to have you around to do things they need you to do. So not everybody is going to think, oh, ML politics is about this, this, this pro programmatically and then come to you. They will come to you because you help them in an admission or help them because they got into some trouble somewhere. You do that. You know. And he was very clear about this, that you have to do that and that that is part of, that is a key part of politics, you know, that people then, um, you know, that, that you're actually doing that work as well for people. So we know there was someone who was a student. He was not in polit a political activist to begin with. He was a student in Banaras and he was an art student and a very artist uh, type of person. And then he began working in Bombay and all of that. And then when his father was killed and all of that, he came back uh, to Jharkhand. And at that time, everyone felt, uh, but he used to always follow politics and he'd been a student activist, but not a, he'd, you know, he'd not worked in that area like that. But then he decided that, you know, something about it, his father's death made him feel he had to come back and do that. And I'm sure it was a very hard thing for him because it must have been pretty tough for him. But he did it. 
and he uh, for him also what politics has been and this public life has been as an mla has been this continuous plea being on demand okay so he and now he is no longer an mla okay he is not an elected mla right now he is not in the assembly but there he is he is still continuously on demand okay so every day if you go to his place now uh, at crack of dawn like at 4:35 onwards because farmers get up that early and then they are there and that sense of entitlement mm. so if vidhayak ji is not awake at that time they'll be very they'll scold him and say you weren't awake we came at 4:30 why weren't you awake then you should be awake <laughs> so he has to make sure he is awake by five latest you know and then be on the go because somebody will come and the problems will range from police uh, harassment to uh, an elephant having come and destroyed somebody's field okay so it will be anything you know and in you know so so he is there on call all the time in part of the duties public duties he said he was putting on weight and i asked him what's up why are you putting on weight and he said i have to attend all these weddings <laughs> and i'm expected to eat at all of them so i'm like okay i can't go you know so in wedding season i seem to be continuously eating so then he decided okay the answer to this is i will walk everywhere so i'll walk to the weddings and i will not eat any of the carbs at the weddings only the only the proteins and then you know limited quantities only of the proteins and after that he was like okay this is i'm a lot fitter now <laughs> because but the point is that that was part of his job because people expected him to be there and be part of their social lives as well and he still had it although he's not an elected mla you know so i think that is the best kind of way that keeps you you know that and he's a very well recognized figure and he has all the public recognition and all of that media and mean media and everything among people but he is also someone who is very grounded and that i think is what a lot of young people in activism today sometimes even in left activism on campuses don't you know they underestimate that that slog that hard work that you you don't become people are pretty demanding public life is demanding there is no shortcut to it social media and media recognition is not a shortcut to it it may give you an initial boost but if you want to do that even if you are ambitious and you want to do that you have to be willing for this slog you know you don't do this and you're out nobody is going to <laughs> is is this transition between uh, student politics in a in a relatively protected campus such as gmu <coughs> and field politics uh, also with backgrounds from more so called provincial uh, universities is it a really difficult transition and is is the tension between the those who have a local profile and those who come from the capital city an uh, easy thing to to resolve uh, again i'll say that there's a partial truth in what you're saying but i have to correct that thing about the because the point is that there's a lot of people from provincial backgrounds who are in jnu so even chandu was from a very much a provincial background so he had an education uh, he had a solid schooling and education but he was always a you know he was someone from a small very small semi rural town in bihar you know and a lot of people so jnu's admission policies and so on part of which was you know through battles we won ensured that a large part of people who came to jnu including women and all of that are from uh, you know provincial rural or semi rural you know semi urban backgrounds so it is not just the background your background that is the issue but it is certainly about you know the tension is between your expectations about politics right about what you expect politics to be and that i think is a real tension because i feel like Uh, sometimes the heat and dust of ml politics uh, some people aren't able to keep up with um, and i'm not saying that everybody has to become a whole time okay there are people who remain with ml politics while being you know teachers or journalists or in other spheres of life okay even 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 in government service and all of that okay so they but they don't have you know they're not saying that they are something that they are not right but for people who who think that they want politics as a career and then they start looking at ml politics and saying oh my god that slog i don't think i want that 
I want something that is a shorter cut, you know, and I want something that is faster here than that, you know, something a little easier than that, <laughs> which I think is, yeah, I mean, I, I understand that happening. I don't, I'm not morally judgmental about that, but I'm pretty, you know, pretty bald when I speak to people about a life in politics, in ML politics. But this is ML politics, you know, it is this, it is a hard slog. You can't get away from that. Yeah. Can I have an idea? Yeah. Yeah. Has your, has your uh, understanding of feminism evolved uh, a lot after all these years of, of practice and commitment? And if it now the, the, more, the more consensual, con uh, consensual notion is queer, queer politics. To which extent are you, are you familiar yeah. or are you comfortable with the evolution that happened in the Yeah, actually, um, it's interesting because in the 90s in India, uh, that was the time when the first queer groups and uh, LGBT groups, you know, sort of started being active on uh, in places like Delhi, for instance. And I know that I myself was part of that uh, change in a way, you know, so in a way, I don't feel like I was outside that change, but I was in a way a part of that change because I know that ever since my BA days in Bombay, I know that my BA days in Bombay were the first, my first exposure to, um, you know, LGBT, uh, you know, lived lives and, uh, the, you know, the, the, the sense that this is something which is facing uh, ostracism and has to, you know, live a, so I had, you know, close friends who were LGBT and who were facing you know, ostracism or had to live a life that was sort of uh, behind the curtain, you know, not able to openly say what was happening and all of that. So that was the first uh, experience. And then in JNU and all of that, I know that I was among those to be, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, very early 90s. So I remember in 95, uh, I asked one of our comrades who was not from JNU, but who was an ISA office bearer at that time, national office bearer. So I asked him about uh, our party's position on LGBT rights and all of that. And he wasn't quite sure, you know, he said, well, there isn't really a movement like that in India, so I don't know. But then because he had some exposure, some international exposure, he told me that the Philippines party had uh, LGBT liberation as part of their party program. And so I said, yes, but shouldn't it be on the party program of any communist party? It is human, you know, this is a human thing. So then he said, okay, I don't know much about it, why don't you tell me? Um, so then he asked some very basic sort of questions, you know, the obvious kind, even of the, you know, semi-homophobic kind. But he didn't ask it in a homophobic way. He said, well, these are what I've heard. What is the fact? So then I told him, that's all rubbish, and here it is, you know. So th I told him about how, uh, you know, sexuality, you know, what what is uh, sexuality seen as now. I had no idea what the Marxist position on it was, none at that time. And I realized that these comrades didn't either. Uh, and then there was this big debate in the 90s in Delhi among women's groups because there was an 8th March demonstration where all the groups, women's groups and feminist groups, left women's groups as well as feminist groups were to have it together. And then there was a debate because some of the more, the bigger women's groups that were left groups like the EDWA and NFIW, they took a position that an LGBT group could come uh, and join but they shouldn't come with their banner because it would distract attention from whatever was the main issue and all of that. And there was a lot of anger about that. And I remember that I was then still a student, but I had attended several meetings on behalf of the student organization ISA, as well as the women's organization, IPWA. And I remember thinking, no, this is wrong, you know, this can't be. So I had discussed with my comrades and persuaded them that we have to take a position that what nonsense. Of course they must participate with their banner and play cards and why pit one issue against the other and say, you know, working class women's issues are different. Come on, you may have LGBT women in the working class as well, but absolute nonsense. So we fought it out and then I realized that there's so many people on the left who are arguing with me. So there was a professor of Delhi University who uh, attended one such meeting quietly, didn't say anything there, and then came up to me later and said, you should read this and he handed me something which I later realized was a British Communist Party thing on homosexuality and it was so bad that I cannot you know it is indescribably horrible okay because it was basically saying in a nutshell that homosexuality is a 
deviance born out of bourgeois society, but it shouldn't be criminalized, but one day it will all be solved and resolved. And what if, in a nutshell, that's what it was saying. So it's completely awful. And I remember thinking, oh my God, what is this? Is this passing off for Marxist positions? Where can I find some Marxist articulation on this? Then I hunted and I found a copy of a Australian, um, you know, at that time, Trotsky's group that we were in touch with as a party. And they had published a very good booklet on uh, LGBT liberation. And they had a whole section on the 1917 Russian Revolution and how the Russian Revolution decriminalized homosexuality yeah. and uh, in fact uh, recognized trans persons and allowed for trans, even, uh, you know, trans uh, transitioning surgeries and all of that, you know, they, they, they developed yeah. all of that and they, they were very, they had an especially particularly modern position on this. So I made copies of that and made it my job to go around distributing it to any and every leftist I could find, irrespective of organization. So in my own organization and party. And after that, in every class that I would take on gender, uh, even within ISA as well as anywhere else, I would also um, factor all this in. So I've had some people come up to me and say, that was unnecessary. You could have avoided it. I've had that said to me by a couple of people and I've said why? It's part of our legacy and we should be embracing this and this is who we should be, this is who we are. Why would we uh, accept the legacy of a homophobic uh, Stalin, uh, you know, Stalin's time you know, became pretty homophobic in Russia. That is not us. That shouldn't be us. You know? So Stalin and Gorky and all who said homophobic stuff, that is a, you know, a black mark on the left. <laughs> you know, and we have this wonderful revolutionary legacy and I think I can take some credit, a little bit of credit for actually educating the left at that time on this and <laughs> changing the positions there. Yeah. And was it, was it or is it still there a conflict between uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of queer feminism that is articulated in some places and the kind of uh, feminist Marxism or queer Marxism that you are articulating in the sense that there is some kind of difference in, in the way some queer movement see their politics only in terms of individual liberation or individual empowerment and not as a collective social empowerment free yeah, from... I don't know about the specific movements and also I won't go there. I mean, I, I don't know enough to critique that. But I would say that in a theoretical sense... Uh, let me talk a little bit about how I understand, for instance, intersectionality and uh, the way I would see it as a Marxist, okay? Uh, I think that, you know, there's a problem with the um, analogy that, you know, intersectionality is based on. Because it's, it's imagining class and caste and gender and race as different parts that are intersecting. And then there's an overlap somewhere there. But that is giving the impression that these are separate systems that are you know, intersecting with each other. Whereas I think that, um, you know, if you look at an actual lived sense of how, um, uh, you know, if you look, for instance, if you look at an individual worker, so the individual worker is not a white straight male, right? Uh, it, all over the world, the, the individual worker is in fact overwhelmingly, you know, um, you know, black or uh, certainly non-white and uh, overwhelmingly women <laughs> and often you know sexuality wise also certainly there is no cause to imagine that they are mostly straight or anything like that and there's disabilities and all of that so how do you understand if you're looking at that actual lesbian woman worker okay who is also disabled how would you look at her she is a person right she is a worker you can't address those things separately and you can't address them as separate. She is, you know, the oppression she faces is comes as a systemic oppression. So I think the ability to understand uh, that those oppressions as a whole is where I find, uh, you know, Marxist concepts of social reproduction useful. I find social reprodu reproduction theory especially useful there in understanding how, uh, you know, these things can make sense. Because in a way then, uh, your understanding exploitation that happens in the spheres of production and oppression that happens in uh, 
the space of social reproduction for instance in where you live or where you you know how you commute or where you study or what you get to study and uh, who care you know who cooks for you how 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 do you provide for yourself and your family and all of that that whole social reproductive world is also very much a part of you know it, it links in with where you work right as a as a worker in the sphere of production right they're linked and so you know to put it really simply i mean I'm, i i used a theoretical vocabulary now but to put it really simply what i what we say uh, you know in our trade union movement for instance is that it isn't enough for trade unions to be organizing in the uh, in the workspace on the factory floor or you know um, among the increasingly casualized workers you know who are uh, informal in the informal economy you can effectively mobilize when you're mobilizing where they live not only where they work right so you have to mobilize where workers live and where workers live everything is an issue you know what kind of water is there drinking water is there running water <laughs> is there clean water what kind of health services are there what kind of education all those things that are considered extraneous to the production process and are actually a part of social reproduction are right there and that includes how you know your sexuality your life as a woman your uh, you know your gender your sexuality your caste and how you are um, you know how you are how your socially how your exploitation becomes enabled by those social structures is all there so i feel like you have to look at it as a whole you have to look at it as one structure rather than as many many parts that are overlapping well, is there some kind of lacking piece in a certain section of the queer literature to see empowerment from the point of view of the individual rather instead of looking at yeah. you know let's say cap and child or other order social structure as a source of uh, uh, yeah of and oppression. yeah and social structure i don't mean only cap i mean even in your lived uh, you know your lived ex- you know for instance even the institution of the family okay which is often very uh, 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 very uh, oppressive for uh, queer people right um now how do you you know family uh, institution can be pretty oppressive for women as well so the household and how it's structured has a potential to uh, offer support as well to women and all of that but it also has you know it is also something that is a place which disciplines sexuality disciplines reproduction disciplines gender and you know exploits the labor of uh, you know women and all of that like gendered labor right so how do you understand that is pretty is it isn't enough to understand it uh, you know your queer um, orientation or identity as something that you have as an individual which um, you know is discriminated against you have to also understand you know what has created this discrimination what are the what are its links with capitalism for instance and this is not an artificial thing the point is that um, for instance uh, how would you understand why uh, homophobic and uh, queerphobic um, you know practices have gained such root uh, almost you know the world over and in in very often displacing um, other cultures that have been more accepting and more uh, open towards it so surely there is a link between that and the global spread of capitalism why because capitalism does not you know capitalism had a, a relationship with the family that was conflicting it needed to bring everybody out into labor so it wanted children to be laborers it wanted women to be laborers and but it also wanted uh, not to have to bear the burden of social reproduction so it needed families to be providing all the cooking and cleaning and caring and emotional labor and all of that so uh, effectively at the end of the day it needed to main, it realized the need to maintain the family really Uh, you know the family as a as a as a body and to maintain the family as a body the whole uh, you know the 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 heterosexual normative heteronormative family as a body based on a heteronormative relationship and all of that it had to criminalize and uh, you know stigmatize other forms of living right mm-hmm. likewise in india you know caste is such a central thing so caste based marriage and reproduction is pretty much key to the reproduction of class uh, you know societies in india key absolutely central 
How do you do that if you don't stigmatize intercaste, interfaith, as well as queer relationships? You have to, because you have to put, you know, reproductive systems based on caste right there at the center of whatever you're doing. Right? Would, would, would you say that what has distinguished uh, uh, first ISA politics and then ML politics in the broader spectrum of the left is also, and this is maybe visible in the pamphlet, a certain form of combination between ideological understanding and emotional understanding of uh, the, the kind of areas and the kind of people you wish and you aspire to, to, to represent. So that the political understanding of ISA and ML is more um, uh, more um, driven towards, for instance, denunciation of oppression than, for instance, uh, SFI and, and no, CPM, who is, who is a more... Um, no, I don't think that it comes from an emotional way. I think it, in a way, you know, this is what Marxism is supposed to be, actually. I think that the Marxism which defines itself in, you know, which says, uh, for instance, just to just to explain what I mean, um, you know, the idea that Marxist politics or Leninist politics is supposed to be only or primarily economic politics is a travesty of what Marx and Lenin were writing about. So, in fact, Lenin specifically writes, he wrote, that uh, the ideal communist is not the trade union secretary. The ideal communist is the tribune of the people, which means the champion of every uh, section that is oppressed, no matter how small that section is and which class that section belongs to. You know, So, uh, this is something that is pretty much key to Leninist politics and the whole idea that uh, you know, the different, you know, the fight against trade unionism is very much a part of the communist movement, right? Like you can't, trade unionism is something that becomes led by uh, the small, you know, the, the, the narrow vision of, okay, how to increase wages or, you know, so, so negotiation, bargaining, that kind of thing. But that is not, that is not the, you know, the seat of, the key to politics is transformative of society, which means you have to address the broader realm of, uh, this lived social and political life, which means that in the lived social and political life, there the oppression is, you know, it is pretty much key, right? Gender, caste, class, all of that. So, you know, just to give you an example from the ML's own political experience, you know, the idea that why was the Ranbir Sena formed by the, you know, this private feudal militia that went around killing the laborers because they supported CPIML. It's often described in terms of, oh, you know, this was because they were demanding land and wages and that's why. No, it was because the, their, you know, the ML had fought for their right to vote, the Dalits' right to cast their vote. They had a right in, in law, but they didn't have it in actual practice. And their casting a vote and electing Dalit, uh, you know, electing Dalit and oppressed caste leaders from the CPIML, um, that as well as their insistence on forming organizations of agricultural poor and peasants and all of that and demanding on negotiating wages and negotiating their right to you know own land and all of that was all seen as a as an honor crime you know so you have Ranveer Sena members describing this in sting operations that Cobra Post conducted saying uh, you know this was an insult to our honor how dare they do this how dare they so in a way, look at how it is that these are material struggles as well as struggles for social dignity, all being seen by the oppressor as a threat to their, to their, you know, social privilege. So you can't separate the. There's no surgical separation of the social oppression and the economic exploitation. There, they're coming in one package, and so you can't fight it separately. You had to fight it in one go. And that is coming from the ML's own lived politics. I don't think it's coming from an emotional place exactly. And uh, my interesting thing is that even in JNU, it is not that, you know, I think I was one of the exceptions who came from a primarily town-based, urban-based uh, place. Most of the activists and leaders of uh, ISA and JNU have been traditionally from oppressed communities and uh, rural India you know, in the 90s, you know, that's where they came from, most of them. And so, in a sense, for them, the connection between those struggles and this 
you know, somebody like Chandrasekhar was from a uh, back, backward caste, uh, you know, single mother who brought him up in, um, you know, rural Bihar, or very, very small town, semi-rural Bihar, you know, semi-urban Bihar. And so he, you know, he, he didn't see, he in fact would have felt somewhat of an alien in the, so he straddled this world in a peculiar way, right? So for him, the urban spaces were something he never felt a full part of. And yet when he had to return to Sivan, he wrote to us about how he struggled with what he missed most when he went back to Sivan, he said, was being able to read at night because there's total darkness there at night and no electri electrification. So he would write letters in the lamplight and say, this is really hard to do. And I miss libraries and I miss being able to attend film festivals and watch international films, you know. So he missed those bits. But the other bits felt like home to him, you know. Those were home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, uh, well, I'll just last just, just question. Yeah. Um, yeah, which, uh, yeah. yeah. So, do you? There are two part. First, the, do you think that the force uh, kind of uh, alliance that is happening nowadays on campus, such as GNU, because of the rays of of uh, Hindu nationalist politics, is in a way uh, hampering or diminishing a certain form of? A debate that was made possible by the intra-level competition in uh, uh, in campus. Um, so the, the, the first question, and the second question is a little bit different. It is related to to uh, uh, the way the way full-time politics uh, uh, has maybe uh, brought you to, to to terms with certain negotiation that electoral politics is bringing. Um, yeah. And in particular, in the case of, for instance, the, the, the Mahagya Bhantan and the Duh? fact that... What's Ma that? Mahagya okay, okay, okay. And yeah. the fact that, for instance, the, uh, there was a certain form of al alliance form of between... Yes. Between uh, uh, ML, ML and, and uh, RGD. RGD. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so I think that that is something, you know, that kind of political adjustment or political alliances... Uh, in terms of countering right-wing politics, I've always, you know, the ML has been open to it always, but I think the only issue has been that it should not come at the expense of the independence of the left. So for the left to become a sort of dependent, you know, even this time, I mean, I would say that, you know, if uh, left parties are fielding candidates in Tamil Nadu who are winning elections in the 2019 elections as well, and then you hear that uh, the ruling, you know, the DMK, the, not the ruling party is the AI DMK at the state, but DMK is the dominant party in that alliance that won most of the seats in the parliamentary election, right? So you figure out that DMK has, you know, given crores of money to, uh, you know, CPI or CPM that have contested elections there. And uh, yeah, that is something which the ML would absolutely never do. On principle, I'm not saying this as a moral thing. I'm saying it simply as something which then affects your politics. Because um, dependence, so we were very clear that if you're contesting elections with the RJD, uh, you know, we will keep hisab, we'll keep accounts of every penny spent. And in joint rallies and all, you spend for whatever you are providing. And we'll spend for our candidates' campaign, you know. We are not going to take... Uh, money for you from uh, for our campaign, not not at all, you know. So that comes where money is concerned, and even where you know your demands are concerned or your political, you know. So the pressure we witnessed on parties, you know, which have allied with the RJD in the past, okay, where initially, where essentially, then there would be an RJD government in Bihar, and uh, the left parties which were in alliance with RJD would feel a constraint to not confront them on their role in enabling the. Uh, in Dalit massacres or the uh, killings in Sivan by uh, RJD leader and Shahbuddin and all of that, right? So that was something we found was, you know, you are uh, suppressing the autonomy, not just of the party, but of the class you represent. Because after all, Shahbuddin, who was he killing? He was killing agricultural landless poor. He was representing not Muslims, but he was representing feudal forces. So was the Ranveer Sena in Bihar. So if you are a left party and who should be representing the, that, uh, you know, the the underclass there, the working class there, 
well, uh, you have to be able to speak up openly against those who are killing you and the government that is allowing this to happen and participating in it, you know, enabling it, whereas they wouldn't. So this situation, I think, was different because the RJD also is not in power. It is an opposition party. We would not participate in government with the RJD. No, we would not. And we had not committed to being part of any government had a government been formed. But on the floor of the assembly or parliament, we would certainly had our representatives, you know, who, whatever elected representatives we have, we would certainly vote uh, to, you know, in if our votes were needed to keep a government out of power in the floor of assembly, in you know, a vote of confidence or something, we would do that, even for an RGD-led government. We've made that clear even before this, not just now. We've said, and we've actually done that also, saying that we won't compromise there. But we won't do it for free. We will also then demand accountability, that, hello, you know, if you've done this, then when are you keeping your promises on land reform? When are you keeping your promises on justice for the Dalit massacres and all of that? We tell you all those things. And then this last bit on, on competition on campus. Is competition on campus, I'll, I'll say it, I'll put it a little differently. I, I'm not saying about whether whether or not it's lost because I think those who are active today, you know, are better placed to tell what form and shape that polemic takes, you know, that uh, I don't think it's entirely gone. I do see some of it even now. Uh, um, you know, there's always in a friendly spirit of criticism, always there is that, even now. But I think that I think of that, you know, I think that those who are impatient with this and think, oh, you know, what is the point of all this internal debating and all of that, I think that they, they underestimate how useful this is for the left. You know, this is not a minor irritation on the left, the arguments that you see. I think of this as very important to keep the left accountable, you know, to its own politics. The fact that you have to argue, that you have to face in a campus like JNU, that you have to justify your politics to a largely leftist, you know, to a, to a leftist public, you know, you have to justify it there. And, you know, so you had left organizations like the SFI and all which uh, suffered because they could not justify a Singur or a Nandigram, you know. Um, and yeah, I think that's damn good for the left, that you cannot take it for granted. People are not going to vote for you out of clubbishness or cultishness. You have to be accountable for your performance in union uh, as well as your politics in general. And I think of that and your positions on national and international issues and I think of that as hugely important. So, and important for the left as a whole because I don't think that these things have affected only JNU politics. I know that the debates on Singur and Nandigram affected you know, the left parties in general as well, because they were forced to respond to arguments that a left public was posing to them in a place like Jane. And, and uh, uh, Nirin and Meaka were very keen to, to, to meet you, so maybe they have just yeah. something to something to, 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 to yeah. ask you. Do you want to ask uh, No, I was just fascinated by the, the social reproductive theory that when you were talking about the LGBT and how it is related to capitalism. I, it, it was it was so illuminating to know that. I mean, I had never thought of it in that way. <laughs> I would like to read more about it. Well, actually, there's a friend of mine who was one of my comrades in ISA in JNU, Tithi Bhattacharya, who now teaches in Purdue in the US, and she's an, a feminist activist yeah. and um, there. So she actually has written... Uh, you know, quite a lot around this and she's edited a, edited a volume on social reproduction which is very good with Sinjia Aruza and she also has a book which I might have here called Feminism for the 99% uh, with Nancy Fraser which is also informed by these ideas so uh, yeah, I think you know she's no longer she wouldn't consider herself an ML person at all anymore but uh, um, yeah she's more on the Trotsky I'd left but she's uh, uh, you know, I, I think that some of the things, you know, some of the discussions we used to have in those JNU days and some of the arguments we used to have among comrades in those days was uh, pretty useful for both of us, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I want to emphasize that also here, you know, that in terms of politics being, you know, that the arguments you have, people sometimes think that arguments within an organization or arguments within, among left organizations are a weakness. I don't. I think that they are you know, they are, they are because we are left, we are not homogeneous mm -hmm. and we shouldn't aim to be, you know, the idea is that arguments uh, make you uh, sharpen your politics, 
we all have you know our politics is, and its articulation have evolved and they evolve in response to whatever arguments you have you know, internally as well so you know i i you know, have these leaflets in hand for instance this is a 1996 leaflet that isa had got out um, you know so um, it's demanding a gender sensitization committee and this was the first time it had been and this was before the vishaka judgment in 97 so this is 96 july you know so um, i find it to be quite an interesting document because it is actually making that key argument that you can't have the administrative structure which is hierarchically biased to defend anyone in the faculty or in administration who's accused and who have zero understanding about sexual harassment or gender sensitization, that they can't be the ones taking decisions on sexual harassment issues. Mm -hmm. You have to have a separate body yeah. that is specifically trained for this. Mm -hmm. This was the first uh, you know, leaflet making this argument and it's a 96 leaflet and you know, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And I think of it as being something that then spurred the movement in JNU, uh, spurred other organizations in JNU to pick up this demand as well. And the left organizations together, you know, achieved the GS cash in JNU along with mm -hmm. left teachers and all of that. Also, uh, we interviewed Albina yeah, yeah. also for this exhibition. Yeah. And uh, what she mentioned was really interesting. She said that today in India with the right wing and the upsurge of nationalism, we do not have a very cogent left alternative and uh, the problem is uh, that the left is not able to articulate solutions for the problems that we are facing as a nation and we are trying to uh, kind of uh, come together with the centre. Uh, their their, their uh, idea of a solution is to come together with the commons perhaps. So do you agree with that? Uh, not exactly. Do you think it's a problem of articulation? Not exactly. I'll tell you my position on that. See, I think that uh, Albina's experience of that, of course, comes from the fact that uh, you know she was in the CPIM, and I think they went through that whole debate within the CPIM over uh, you know Sindhu and Nandigram and over the uh, CPM's participation in the UPA government and all of that. So that's a different trajectory in a way, and. I can understand what she's saying mm -hmm. from where she comes from, but in a larger place, you know, I think that the the the, the, the crisis of the left is not only there. You know, uh, it's not about you know because I'm saying you know, coming with the Congress or not is not really the key issue. Yeah. You know, for instance, against the BJP in the ML, you uh, ML had never ever ever offered any political support to um, most bourgeois parties and not certainly not the Congress. But in this last election, we did so with barely any argument, you know, that where there is no, you know, with the strong left alternative. Yeah. Well, you should absolutely vote for whoever is in the opposition there. And mm -hmm. we had no, you know, we had, we discussed this, we debated this in our party Congress and it was unanimously passed. There was no big issue about this. Why? Because, and we don't think that that makes that is that marks any big shift in our politics. Our, sh the, our politics has been about the left's independence, you know. So if the left becomes subservient to, so if you're becoming a part of the UPA government in the sense of okay, then you have to defend all the crimes of the okay, UPA government, yeah. including the nuclear deal and whatnot. Okay, uh, then that's terrible. You know, why would you do that? Don't become part of the government. Mm -hmm. Be a critical opposition. Our position of, about parliamentary participation of the left is that you have to be a uh, revolutionary opposition, always. Mm -hmm. Don't become part of the, the system. Yeah. Even if you are a left government in a state, don't become part of uh, the, you know, be an oppositional mm -hmm. government. Don't be somebody who becomes embedded and invested in maintaining the system. That's pretty ABC in terms of Marxist Leninism, Marxism Leninism. Mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 like duh, you know. You're supposed to <laughs> know that. If you don't do that, then in a way, then you know, a, a left politics that starts thinking, I have to defend the system, you know, is itself then becoming weaker as a left. You know, it, you don't need an outsider to come and weaken you. Then mm -hmm. that is the way I see it. So I don't see it in terms of a Congress or not Congress. 
I think she was you know? talking about in the sense that le- the left is not able to provide a clear alternative. No, but it's not because you know it fell in into terms of electoral politics. Yeah, but I'm saying even in electoral politics, uh. the problem is that what happened was the left was exceptionally successful in electoral politics. Yeah. CPM was, we were not. Hmm. Okay, so CPIM was, you know, with all my criticisms of CPIM, but they led governments for 30, 35 years unbroken. Hmm. Who does that? Okay, in hmm. Bengal and Tripura, no other party in India has yeah. done that. So the idea that the left can't be electorally successful, can't offer an alternative, is clearly untrue. It can. But the point is that why did they lose out in Bengal? They lost out because they started saying that uh, it is idiotic to say that the peasants' land should not be grabbed by big corporations. And they started backing the corporations against the peasants. So of course they lost support. You know, that is so simple and so obvious that you wonder that there should be any discussion about this. You know, of course you shouldn't have done that. If you hadn't done that, you'd probably still be enjoying a whole lot of support. In fact, more so right now with the rise of the right and all of that, you know. So I feel as though, you know, these are, you know, pretty obvious things, which of course there are difficulties. You know, for a party like mine, I know that electoral politics has been so challenging because in North India especially, Uh, you're up against forces that are, uh, you know, the kind of feudal violence that uh, we have had to face and the setbacks that we've had to face in terms of, you know, outright killing of, you know, every cadre, every leader that you nurture, you know, look at what goes into that person's coming into being as a leader, you know, and for that person to be wiped out in an instant by a bullet, uh, you know, is this terrifying, you know, it is, it's awful. Irreplaceable. So it's a very difficult. I, I don't know how to, you know, explain this. I always find it difficult to talk about it in very bland terms because I feel as though, you know, all that emotional labor that I talked about, all that sort, you know, all that thing that goes into the formation of a political activist in the ML, wiped out in no time by a bullet. You know, somebody like Mahendra Singh, who is an unbeatable MLA somebody whom everybody knew will just never be defeated as an MLA because he holds the confidence of people in his area so much. So the only way is to go and you know get rid of him physically. That's that's the kind of thing we've been up against and it's very hard. You know. so, so I think that in terms of electoral success and alternatives, I won't say, you know, we have all the answers to alternatives. You know. The point is that I think we have to look at our achievements differently also. For the ML, the achievement, one of the big achievements has been changing the social landscape of Bihar, social and political landscape of Bihar. If uh, RJD did that to an extent, if Lalu did that to an extent, the ML did it before Lalu did (coughs) and in a way, you know, opened the way for that and did it in a very lasting and very big way. So the very fact that you have feudal practices that are unheard of today in Bihar, but were, you know, were there as late as the 1980s, and they, oh, they have, they went because of the ML movement. That's it. I don't see that as any less significant than electoral victories. Whatever electoral victories we got were victories as a result of this, mm-hmm. this practice we had, as a result of these achievements and these victories. So I feel that you know um, we shouldn't be too hung up on that. Electoral victories are good; they're important, but they come as a part of other victories. Again, I say that in the context of the individual, those who look at themselves as individual leaders and individual political careers as well. It doesn't work like that on the left. You can't do left politics like that. You can do other politics like that, but you can't do left politics. Left politics is not about you winning. Left politics is about your cl- you know, the class you represent winning. And it has to win battles, it has to win achievements, and, it, and you will lose a whole lot of more battles than you win. You know, that includes electoral battles. So when young people ask me, oh, but if I continue in ML politics, uh, then, you know, you know, they ask people like me or Sucheta and all of that, that oh, you've done so well in JNU politics, but where are you going to contest and win next? You know, what does the party have for you? And we answer, but we are, you know, we are party activists. We, have, we are doing the work that we love and that we do well, and we are doing the work that we are needed to do. We contested and won elections where we think we, you know, where it was where we could contest and we could win. We don't have to now look for a seat where we can contest elections because we don't think we are the best people to contest an election from the ML. Not necessarily. Someday, perhaps, 
some day in delhi or in kolkata if we build up that kind of strength of the party maybe we'll be the ideal candidate there yeah, perhaps fine <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I, I have two questions, but I'm more interested in the first one. I feel so. You've been into politics since college life, and I'm sure there must be. It 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 takes an emotional and psychological toll on you. So, were there points in your life where you went through depression or some mental health issues, and how did you deal with them? And do you still go through them? And how are you dealing with them now? Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, very much you know i'm glad you asked because i think that this is such a taboo subject uh, especially in indian politics you know because in indian politics the idea is that your leader is supposed to be a god you know mm -hmm. so the idea is that you're supposed to be able to you know, your your leader shouldn't start showing physical or emotional or mental weaknesses you're not supposed to show weakness and you know so even on the left there's that whole thing you know that you're not supposed to have flaws you're supposed to be somebody people can look up to and all of that so i i'm trying very hard to do what i can to change that okay to say that of course we all go through it i know and especially now i think my uh, you know the issues i have i know other young people who have faced issues even while in campus politics because the you know the rough and tum you know the the very a very aggressive and sometimes nasty politics between left groups and all especially in the 2000s you know when isa started winning elections in a big way and all it was very it was very hard for some of our young activists especially young women activists very hard on them and i think yes there were issues for them then which you know, see i didn't face those so much as a student activist but certainly in the past 5 or 6 years yes uh, the rise of right far right uh, fascist politics in india the being in power has been extremely stressful and uh, i see the impact it takes on me as well as on other you know, people including young activists and i'm you know i speak about this quite openly all the time saying yes i take help for it yes i do i have gone through depression uh, especially due to you know uh, as i said i i think the roots of that lie in the fact that i'm a private person and when i'm subjected to very unfair uh, political targeting on social media uh, organized trolling on social and i don't mean it only from the rss and the sang i can actually deal with that a little bit better but when it has happened from you know one so called allies and you've been attacked for supporting rape survivors you've been attacked for surviving rape victims and or you've been attacked uh, for holding up a principled position on human rights uh, even when it comes to you know sexual harassment or rape and all of that and instead of there being a friendly disagreement you know social media often becomes a space where it is clannish and you know uh, very superficial so there is you know well many feminists you know in my experience of feminist politics we've been able to hold disagreements while holding respect for each other Uh, with a whole lot of feminists who are not left wing, who are not Marxist, or I've had, I've been able to learn from them, disagree with them, express the disagreements without any, you know, diva syndrome on any side. Okay, but but with respect. But now it's become, I think, you know, with social media, it becomes harder because you tend to be, you know, you have to either play to certain galleries and say the popular things. If you say something that is out of line with a you know popular something then you will be attacked very badly and i've had i found it very very difficult to deal with this and i yeah, those are the episodes of uh, depression that i have suffered and i have had to seek out help for that because and i've realized that you know also because i'm a woman in my 40s and uh, you know one does go through changes your body goes through changes at this time where you feel uh, you find it harder to deal with uh, you know the you find it harder to deal with your own um, issues you find it harder to also uh, absorb the kind of suffering and pain that you're seeing <laughs> and dealing with and responding to so if you you know if you're dealing with kashmir or if you're looking at you know just rape if you're dealing with rape survivors and domestic violence survivors and all of that all the time it is e hard takes a toll and so i think the recognition that you know that this is perfectly okay that your brain also is an organ of your body that is going to come under strain and stress and you know you need to take help for it is something i you know i keep telling everybody that we should accept this so i know that i have uh, i do uh, take uh, 
both medical help as well as um, you know I've become a I try to be as regular as I can with mindfulness meditation kind of thing mm. which I think of as a very materialist practice actually because mm-hmm. I realized that in fact far from being a airy airy sherry uh, you know uh, up there spiritual practice it's actually a very materialist practice because it keeps reminding you not to live in your head but to remind yourself that you are actually a lived body to not live in the future or live in the past and keep you know but to live in the present and you know that's how useful is that politically because right now when the tendency is to either sink into despair and say oh you know it's hopeless look at the fascists everybody is going to you know fall for them and you know nothing can happen so you feel like no you can actually think uh, you know at the here and now and try to break it up into pieces and see okay you know uh, here are what needs to be done here is what you're up against you need to face this reality and not succumb to despair uh, by you know building up conjectures about you know what your society is like and how it's all hopeless but you know it's you know, you do what you can you can say okay is this thing doable can you do this much yes you have to do it and you know you never know when it's going to break doors down and actually change things and sometimes it does so i find that even the mindfulness practice helps there so i recommend this to everybody i keep recommending it i keep recommending to my comrades also that you know people who are in this should not feel any hesitation about admitting to weakness admitting to depression perfectly all right yeah. Okay, so the other question very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, we've been uh, hearing a lot of right winger interviews as well, and they keep mentioning one aspect in JNU that there is a lot of anti Hindu ceremony sentiment within the left. That if some some Hindu person is wearing symbols associated with their Hindu identity, or if they want to party in the hostel, there is a kind of opposition from the left. and whereas they do minority appeasement and are fine with muslim prayers and practices so where do you see left and its balance with religious identity actually that's not true at all that's a complete canard actually because i know uh, you know i've been roommates with people who have been deeply devout okay who have certainly uh, you know had you know religious ceremonies i know i know my sister's roommate i remember that you know they would have you know gods in the room and those thing i have known people even on the left like on the left meaning okay they are supporting isa but they have you know gods in the room hindu uh, you know uh, idols in the room and all of that and they never demand never deride them for that and all of that you know these are things which are an individual private thing nobody can dictate that you uh, you know 